Welcome to MS Learn Online. I'm Tracy Kimball. And I'm Tom Kimball. Problems with walking can be common in MS. In fact, it's such a big issue, we have a two-part series to talk about it. Dr. Francois Betou from the Cleveland Clinic talks to medical correspondent Rick Summers about some of the common walking or gait issues. Dr. Betou begins by explaining how MS affects one of the most basic functions of the human body. We all rely on walking to get around and do stuff, and we almost don't even think about it because, you know, after childhood, it becomes an automatic function, basically. And, uh, but when uh, MS causes some impairments, then walking may become more difficult and uh, sometimes even impossible uh, in certain circumstances. And then there's the need for more energy or for more control conscious control of gait. So these are all these issues together that are embedded in the same gait disorders, which means basically uh, difficulty walking around. I've got a laundry list here of, of things that contribute to uh, loss of control in gait. I'm going to read down the list and then we'll go back and revisit one by one. Spasticity, fatigue, loss of balance, sensory deficit, and weakness. So let's start with spasticity. Well, spasticity is frequent in MS. There are publications that, you know, tell us that up to 80% or more of patients with MS have some degree of spasticity, and maybe up to a third of patients have spasticity that really impacts their function. And, you know, when uh, the legs are stiff or mm -hmm. spasming, uh, it becomes more difficult to walk. It's kind of, some patients describe it to me as they have to fight their own legs to, to walk, basically. So it's important to take that into account. How about when your legs feel heavy? So that's the tricky part, because some people will come and say, my legs feel stiff, because they mean they have difficulty moving them. But actually, uh, their legs are weak, and that's where the heavy part comes in. Okay. My legs are heavy, I have difficulty lifting them, then I can't clear my foot, and then I stumble, I may even fall which, you know, is not only embarrassing, but sometimes dangerous, because you could break a bone. I want to come back to that, because I want to ask you another question along those lines. But next, let's address fatigue is a factor uh, across the board for MS patients. But this is uh, something that really comes into play with um, the gait issue. Certainly, certainly. I mean, we know that most patients with MS have some degree of fatigue. And, and that can interfere with many of their functions, but in particular with walking. Because even if somebody physically would be able to walk, say does not have weakness or, sp or spasticity, but if they have significant fatigue, then after they walk a certain distance or a certain time, they basically have to stop because they run out of energy. Right. And so that can be a significant limitation just by itself. Can you tell me what drop foot is? Drop foot is basically when um, it becomes difficult to uh, pick up the toes uh, to clear the foot because when we advance a leg, well, the toes are not supposed to be dragging because otherwise you, you may again, we may uh, stumble. Uh, so the drop foot is basically just when the toes drop down instead of pointing up uh, when we try to clear our foot. And it can be due to weakness, uh, can be due also to spasticity in the muscles that make our toes go down. Okay. So as we try to walk, these muscles become more and more stiff and they make they push the toes down literally. You treat patients with that and how do you um, basically uh, prescribe? Is it medication or physical therapy? Probably all of the above and even more. And drop foot is very common in MS. Right. And, and you know, many patients complain of, well, I'm, you know, stubbing my toes on the mm -hmm. floor and especially when we have new carpeting in our center you know the first few patients that run on there notice that their feet and toes seem to stick to the floor more uh, so it's pretty easy to detect obviously but then when we examine we have to understand why the foot is dropping is it spasticity is it weakness uh, could be also even a, a loss of the sensation of where the foot is in space so that patients are not able to correct for the, for the toes dropping. So then we take all of this into account and we design a treatment plan and certainly rehabilitation and exercise are always a component of the treatment plan. Uh, but there can be also devices like braces that right. uh, patients can wear to just passively prevent the foot from dropping. They are you know, usually very easy to wear. Uh, not everybody is comfortable with wearing them, 
but they can certainly be an easy fix if you wish for a drop foot. Uh, but there are even other devices now that are on the market uh, that can compensate for some of that weakness by providing electrical stimulation to yes. help pick the toes up. Uh, these are very um, exciting devices for us, uh, even though we have to remember everybody, including our patients, that they may not be you know, the ultimate cure-all for their right. walking problem. Yeah, I mean, they can be a significant improvement, and what they do if you compare them with classic braces is that they do provide an active movement, actually, of the foot, uh, active movement up, uh, as opposed to the braces that just keep the foot in a neutral right. position. So there's even a hope to provide a training effect, actually, with these devices. How about loss of balance and how that plays into gait? This is a big issue, big issue, because you know, when balance is affected, uh, basically then there may be some falling involved and, and uh, people become very unsure about, uh, about their ambulation. So they may even hesitate to go out you know, uh, in, in public or, or just go out on uneven terrain because mm -hmm. they're afraid to fall. And uh, you know, these, um, the difficulty is again the unpredictability. You never know when an obstacle may present or just there may be more fatigue, you don't pay as much attention. Or there's a distraction, you know, you're trying to talk to somebody, and then you get caught by surprise and you may stumble and fall. So the, this is a very important issue, and there are some things that can be done about it, uh, probably not as many as we have for uh, gait, but mm -hmm. uh, there are certainly some exercises, uh, there's a few strategies that can be used also to try and improve balance. I wanted to ask you about strengthening, because weakness was one uh, on our laundry list of, of gait-related issues. Can you actually strengthen yourself to have a better gait? Well, that's one of the difficult issues because we know that some of the weakness comes from the damage that has been done by the MS uh, in the nervous system, in the brain and spinal cord. So we know we can't hope, at least right now, to just erase all that damage and bring people back to full strength. But there's also a loss of strength that comes from what we call deconditioning, which means that if it's difficult to do something, well, we tend to do it less. It's not laziness, it's just adaptation, mm -hmm. because it costs so much energy, so much attention, say, to walk, to climb a flight of stairs, while we tend to maybe you know, take the elevator more often, or tend to stay home more often and not walk as much, and then we get out of shape, we get deconditioned, and that you know, leads to loss of muscle mass and loss of strength. And that part we can hope to reverse, actually. So that's why exercise is so important. You know, aerobic exercise, strengthening exercise, to try and improve strength as much as we can. And the problem with that is you have to keep doing it. It's the same as you know, anybody doing exercise. You have to keep doing it on a regular basis to maintain these gains. But I've seen uh, patients get, and actually balance, improve significantly yeah. just with consistent exercises. But the key word here is, is to be consistent with it. it doesn't have to be torture, doesn't have to be two hours a day, but it uh, has to be almost every day. This is maybe a rather obvious question that I've never asked before. How about what you wear on your feet? Does that affect this at all? Even for people without MS, you know, you could wonder right. some of these high heels, the stiletos, are quite anti-physiologic. But, you know, when MS kicks in and there are gait problems, certainly there are some, you know, uh, types of shoes that either should not be worn or should be worn with caution. And you know, many of my patients end up uh, wearing you know, running shoes or mm -hmm. that type of shoes that seem to hold the foot better. Or uh, some patients actually like to have these you know, slip-in shoes where there's nothing to hold the heel in the back. And these are very easy to put on, mm -hmm. which is why they like them. We don't like them as much because then it's easy for the foot to also slip out of the shoe. Right. And then you may become off guard and have a problem there. I didn't realize that there are so many factors that can contribute to gait issues. Indeed. Dr. Betu has only just begun to discuss some of the options available to assist with gait. So join us again on the next webcast to see how physical therapy, medications, and assistive devices can make a difference. We'll see you then.